quick announcements one twitch is going awesome so if you guys have not followed me over to twitch I found out you don't have to download software you don't have to download the actual app but I wanted to share you guys like now that I've been doing twitch for like a week I really wanted to share with you what it's like I was as uncertain as you guys like I had no idea what to expect I didn't know if it was gonna be similar to YouTube it's actually nothing like YouTube and actually all of you guys that have already moved with me that have like subscribed and followed me it has turned into like a paranormal event for the night and everyone talks in chat everyone's like becoming like paranormal friends they're exchanging like social media information so it has actually become like a social event. So you don't have to download or anything like that. When a post shows on Twitter that I'm about to go live, you can just click the link and you wait in the link and that's it. I'm just saying that it benefits you guys actually more than it does me because it is literally a community on Twitch and it's bully free, like bully free zone, everyone gets along, total 100% paranormal. Everyone that's already there with me has come up with something that is now becoming a ritual which is called a weekly paranormal pajama party. That's literally what they titled it. So the first one we had was the upload you guys saw on YouTube which was my Twitch stream of actually reviewing and watching the Demon House live. It's actually a lot of fun because while I like sit down and review like and talk about it and watching it, everyone else is chatting like in the chat and they're like all excited sharing paranormal stories. So I'm just saying you're missing out. Second announcement, Instagram has announced that they are going to be placing back timeline posts, basically rolling them backwards a little bit. I kind of feel bad for Snapchat at this point. The new update, no one's using it. I'm not using Snapchat because it's a horrible interface. So Instagram basically stole all of Snapchat's filters to make Insta Live, which I've been using Insta Live and Insta Story. And then while Snapchat was down, while like stocks are down and no one's using it, Instagram comes back and says, oh, we're going to go back to using like your timeline event in Instagram. Bye bye Snapchat, I guess. Like that's the end of Snapchat, guys, like for real. The one thing that's bothering me the most about Snapchat is I am not following a single Kardashian willingly and all of their stories come up first on Snapchat and I'm like, oh, kill me now. I do not want to follow the Kardashians. Third announcement, there was a really weird viral flyer that was made that stated that Amy Allen and Steve from Dead Files were going to Zach's museum for an investigation to film. I actually laughed about it and ended up retweeting it, so I just wanted to confirm to you guys that Zach saw it and told me, no, it's not true. So try not to pass that around so that we can like put the wildfire out because a lot of people were getting like mad and upset that they were going. Anyway, it's not true, so let's just put that wildfire out now. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to my channel after all of my many public service announcements in the paranormal world. I am here because we need to fill in some blanks. As you guys saw me writing all of my notes here on the Demon House, I have many, many updates. So I'm just going to literally go down the list. So let's first talk about LaToya Ammons. Did not want to converse or be any part of Zach's documentary with the Demon House. We did note that there was some sort of a producer that was involved that had signed some sort of contracts going on. So a lot of people have asked why did the priest, you know, why was he able to talk to Zach? 
and why were the police be able to talk to Zach along with the social workers and all that stuff. My assumption is that this other production company or producer put LaToya Ammons and her family in something that's called an NDA, also known as a non-disclosure agreement. Speaking of the Kardashians, that's exactly what they're famous for. Basically, anyone that comes in the Kardashians' lives, Kris Jenner makes them sign an NDA. So before you can even be friends with Kylie Jenner or any of the other sisters, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which basically means anything that you hear or say or are part of with those people, you cannot talk of outside of that circle. So when going back to LaToya Ammons, she basically has been silenced by this other production company and I can only assume it's because of money. Obviously the producers and the production company of this other company that we're not sure of who it is yet, obviously they are talking money with LaToya. We did hear the statistics that Gary Indiana is known for having a very high poverty rate, which is really sad. So unfortunately with LaToya, money is going to talk. It's also very hard to get out of a non-disclosure agreement once you're in one. Sometimes they have expiration dates, but usually they don't. And usually to get out of an NDA, you have to go to court and sue over it. So I feel like this topic scoots right into the next topic, which you guys saw me on film live watching the Demon House get actually really upset for Zach that someone was calling him and threatening him to shut down his production. So not only did I do some research of my own, but I also have producer friends in Los Angeles that all called me like the next day. All of them went to work trying to dig up who they could find, who had anything to do with this. Working as a producer and in production myself, I will say that sometimes there are things you have to do that are through loopholes. So an example of this would be if I needed to go film at a location somewhere in the world, I didn't realize that I needed a permit to actually film there. So I go to the city, state, or county building and ask them, how do I get a permit? They tell me it's a three week wait. Is there a loophole I can find in order to get that production to continue filming at that location? That's one example. Even within loopholes, as a producer, you have to work within the law. You have to work within legality. And whoever this gentleman was, was not working within legal realms, which is also why Zach was able to expose him because he was in fact trying to bully Zach. The other thing you have to remember is although Zach hid his identity for the purpose of privacy laws, when you agree to listen to someone's voicemail and leave them a message, you are agreeing that that voicemail is now that person's property. So for him to leave that threatening message on a recording was kind of foolish, if you ask my opinion. So after doing lots of research, this is what I have come up with. I would first like to state that due to YouTube standards, laws, regulations, guidelines, and rules, I am strictly doing this on opinion and on review. That is to save me and that is to save my channel. This is 100% my opinion and review. I am not 100% certain on who this is, but in my opinion, I think I have an idea of who it is. Bringing up the very first article that I would like to show you guys that is titled, Warner Brothers Settles 1 Billion Conjuring Suit Mastermind producer has been unmasked. Parties have reached a settlement in this matter and it seems that longtime disgruntled producer Tony DeRosa Grund, I believe is how you pronounce his name. This is also a picture of this gentleman so that you know who I'm talking about. Has been unveiled as the secret mastermind behind the latest attempt to grab a hold of The Conjuring. Profits spew out over four films and more to come. So it says the parties are working to resolve counterclaims. This producer is claiming content rights over this huge settlement with Warner Brothers for The Conjuring. While I was editing this, I realized I needed to add a little bit more information. So basically what this lawsuit is about is Tony, this producer, he got in litigation with Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers is the production company that did The Conjuring. So you might be asking yourself, how did he even get in litigation in the first place if Warner Brothers was actually 
the production company behind it. So here's my opinion. Tony must have had the Warrens or someone involved with the Warrens sign some sort of contract from years ago because he wanted to produce a movie like The Conjuring. If you look at his IMDb Pro digital resume, it shows he only did one movie in 2001, which was Josie and the Pussycats, and then the next one he was given credit for was The Conjuring in 2013. So you might ask yourself, how does someone that has such a successful movie like The Conjuring not have any other movies under their belt because we have to admit Josie and the Pussycats was not a very good movie. Well, obviously he was paid out this millions or billion dollar status with Warner Brothers probably because he had a contract or a non-disclosure agreement signed with the Warrens or someone involved with the Warrens. He probably sat on that contract for years with no expiration date. The Warrens probably assumed that the contract had expired because they haven't heard from Tony in years. And then here comes Warner Brothers wanting to do an actual movie on The Conjuring, actually act on it. And then after the success of The Conjuring, Tony comes back and sues Warner Brothers stating, wait a second, I had a contract or a non-disclosure agreement with them years ago. You have stolen my idea. And that's how he gets paid out this large sum of money. I'm assuming he's gonna do the same thing with Latoya Ammons. He has her sign a contract a few years ago. She ends up having to sign a non-disclosure agreement and he's not gonna make any moves on it until possibly another production company comes in, maybe even someone like Zach, and then he can threaten to sue them, or he can threaten to take part of the royalties that are made when it comes out in theaters or on digital release, because that's the easiest way to make some money. It's undisclosed in what amount he has actually won. We don't know, no one really knows. Usually that stuff is sealed in some sort of a file and you're not allowed to legally, publicly disclose it unless TMZ gets a hold of it. So who exactly is Tony De Rosa Grund and why is he threatening Zach to shut down his production? Shockingly, this gentleman does not have the biggest background that you would think he had. He was on set, I believe, as a producer for Sabrina the Teenage Witch in 1999. He also worked on one season of Archie the comic books in, I think, the 90s as well. The other thing that he's known for is working on the set of Josie and the Pussycats in 2001. And the only other thing is The Conjuring. The Conjuring was in 2013. From what I can see from Mr. Tony is that if he doesn't get his way, he either goes around suing or threatens to sue. That's just what his track line is on his digital print on the internet. What's also so shocking to me is he really feels like he owns, like since he did this billion dollar lawsuit with Warner Brothers, however much he got, it was a lot in his mind it would appear that he owns all paranormal stories to make them his own Hollywood scheme. So let me just read this. This is the other part of the article on him. An apparently brazen disregard for previous restrictions on any more legal action over the successful The Conjuring flicks and Annabelle spin-offs, De Rosa Grun not only conjured up out of the thin air 900 million figure that Brittle is now seeking an abandoned effort at the 1.2 billion earnings franchise, but a discovery and declarations have been made clear, which was pulling the strings out of Brittle even being involved. New Line has contended along that D. Rosig Rund was the mastermind behind the lawsuit, he was controlling and directing the lawsuit, and had attempted to enter a secret side details with Brittle. A December 8 notice of additional evidence from Warner Brothers and New Line stated here, quote, in the last week, New Line has received additional documents proving these points that were directly responsive to the subpoenas at which the subpoenaed parties failed to produce. Quote, Mr. D. Rosegrund has been controlling this litigation from the start. Based on a review of text messages between Mr. D. Rosegrund and my attorney, here's the sentence that gives it away to the way he called Zach. Quote, I understand that he even threatened my attorneys that if they sent information from me without him seeing it first that they would be fired. And additionally, quote, 
when my attorney informed Mr. DeRosa Grund that I was the client and needed to approve discovery responses, Mr. DeRosa Grund responded with, good then, Gerald, the effing pay you, and then stated, oh yeah, he doesn't have a pot to piss in. I forgot. Whoever this guy is, I'm just gonna say it, is just an ass. If this is the guy that is behind movies that we love, like The Conjuring and Annabelle, not even, like, put Zack aside. Do we really want to support someone like this in the film industry that just thinks he owns all of these haunted and horror stories? I don't think so. I'm not going to let him see a penny of my money from here on out. And I mean pulling Zach into the matter. So many of you follow me are always like, I want to do my own documentary, I, I want to do my own series, I want to be a producer, I want to do all these things in paranormal. From your standpoint, do you want to support someone that's in the film industry that is trying to silence us as creators? That's what he tried to do with Zach. He's trying to silence him as a creator. This is an art form. Even though it's a documentary, putting it together is an art form. Shooting it is an art form. Looking at paranormal and all of its interests that we have other than science is still an art form. I will not support someone that is trying to silence the real authentic paranormal community. I am still upset about this. I assume that one of the reasons he tried to shut down Zack's production is we all know what he did with The Conjuring and those other movies, right? Of course they make a bigger deal out of them what, than what they really are. Annabelle doll, which is just an old Raggedy Ann doll and turned it into this monstrous, creepy looking thing, so we know Hollywood has their hands in it. The problem is, is that even us as real authentic paranormal investigators, as much as we love the real raw side of it, we still go to support movies like that because we love them, right? Well then, in my opinion, one thing this guy shouldn't have done is shit on the paranormal community. That's my opinion. Especially the raw documentary side that we all approve of. We would have gone to see his stupid Demon House movie anyways, probably. But not when he's like this. I don't like play... I do not like people, especially in film, that do not play fair game. So this is just my opinion, and this is just my review. The next thing is I found an article with the Reverend. So the question is, why was Zach able to talk to the Reverend, uh, Reverend Michael Magnot, and why was he able to talk to the police if obviously this Tony DeRosa Grun guy had an NDA on LaToya? Well, the answer is, I do not think that he can give them non-disclosure agreements. One, because he's a Reverend, which means he works in the the Catholicism Church of the Archdiocese, he can't make a police officer sign a non-disclosure agreement because he would be frauding his job as a police officer in law enforcement. But of course with LaToya, he can hang money over her head. So in this actual article that I found online, it says, The Reverend Michael Magnot has signed a deal with Evergreen Media Holdings to bring the exorcisms of LaToya Ammons to the big screen. The, the Reverend has signed a contract with Tony D. Rosa's Grund, Evergreen Media. This is who did it, in my opinion. This is who has these NDAs. Magnot declined disclosure terms with his contract with Evergreen executive, Tony D. Rosa Grund, calling it a standard deal. De Rosa Grund produced The Conjuring, which grossed over three, which grossed over $318 million worldwide. After the star published an article about Ammons claiming that she and her three children had been possessed by demons, the story received international attention. More than a dozen movie producers and countless TV shows have asked for interviews. Magnot, who performed a series of exorcisms on Ammons, said that he signed a contract with D. Rosa Grund because he felt like the producer wouldn't sensationalize what happened. Three hundred and eighteen million worldwide of the conjuring sounds like some sensationalizing, that's just my opinion. The story is as good as it gets, Magnot said. You don't need to go crazy with it. Do you want to know who will go crazy with it? I mean we know. We know. Magnot also said that he signed a contract with Zach Bagans, host and executive producer of Ghost Adventures on the Travel Channel, to make a documentary. Next, look how big this pile is. You guys like 
I do my homework, okay? I tried to look up Valerie Washington to see if she existed as a real person on social media or anything else. I can't find her anywhere, but I do believe she's real because I did find articles on her that stemmed back to like 2014 and 2012. So it's authentic, like her name was written with CPS officially. This was another um, article that I found. This was written on January 27th of 2014 in the New York, in the New York Daily News, okay? So this is Latoya Ammons. So she's basically talking about her 12-year-old daughter would levitate above the bed and even in the hospital room. Apparently she started having levitations happen with her kids four months after her family moved into the rental, um, which was March 10th, 2012, is when she actually signed the lease. Apparently her grandmother had heard, or I guess it would be the grandma, so Latoya's mother, which we saw in the documentary, heard um, a scream come from her da granddaughter's bedroom at about 2 a.m. in the morning. She said, I thought to myself, what is happening? What's going on and why is this happening? When the grandmother walked in, they saw the child levitating above the bed. The girl fell back down onto the bed when the grandmother walked in and she regained consciousness but had no memory of what happened. Apparently, two clairvoyants in this article also went in the house saying that the house was filled with more than 200 demons. The, the family church recommended that olive oil be poured on the Ammon's children, hands and feet, and smeared across their foreheads to form protection barriers. I've never heard that before, but... One clairvoyant's recommendation to the frightened mother was to make an altar in the basement with a white candle with statues of Mary Joseph and Jesus. So it says that for three days, Latoya and a friend prayed over the altar and for three days nothing happened, but then the children that she had began to act out. The mother of the youngest was the seven-year-old seven boy, so apparently her children were describing what it was like to be killed. Her seven-year-old flew out of the bathroom and her 12-year-old required stitcher, stitches after being hit in the head. The girl told healthcare professionals that she sometimes felt like she was being choked and a voice would tell her that she'd never see her family again. On April 19th, 2012, one family went to see Dr. Jeffrey O-N-Y-E-U-K-W-U, whose encounter with the children he said he would never forget. They actually have quotes from him. 20 years and I've never seen anything like this in my life. I was scared myself when I walked into the room. Apparently one of the boys started cussing at the doctor in a demonic voice. And then him and his brother would pass out and come to back when they were in this doctor's visiting room. The police were called. When the children woke up, they were in the hospital. They began screaming and violently thrashing themselves around. It took five men to hold the seven-year-old boy down. The children's behavior was so unusual and unexplainable that the doctors feared their mother was suffering from mental illness and possibly encouraging the children to act that way. Because of this incident, it, it looks like the doctors reported her for possible child abuse. She was evaluated by a hospital psychiatrist, the mother was, and she was to be known of a sound mind. Valerie Washington was called, the CPS worker, to the house to evaluate the children. When she met the youngest, he started to growl and flash his teeth at her, and his eyes started to roll into the back of his head. Then the seven-year-old lunged at his brother and put his hands around his throat while saying, in a voice that wasn't his own, it's time to die, I will kill you. Once released from his brother's grasp, the nine-year-old allegedly started headbutting his grandmother. Campbell took away his hand and started to pray with the boy, and that's when the boy walked backwards up the ceiling. Once there, he flipped and landed perfectly on his feet. Valerie Washington, a CPS worker, was called into the hospital where they were to evaluate the children. Willie Lee Walker, a registered nurse who was in the room with them as well. I'm going to look these, the nurse and the doctor up to make sure they're legit. Gary Police Captain Charles Austin accompanied the two women with Washington and another officer. Austin tells that, that, visit he believes that after that visit he believes in both ghosts and demons. He also vowed to never go inside the house again. This is when they went to the home, they took the audio recorder, all of their batteries died while listening to the recorder later they heard the words say, hey. Photos in the home in the basement appeared to have cloudy images on the, sh on the stairs. An image resembled a face 
a second, a green image that allegedly resembled a female figure. Both in the end of the month, the petition of DCS. Okay, so it says, temporary wardship of the three children was granted by Lake Juvenile Court. The department argued that the children missed the school too much, and their mother argued it was because of illness and because of the home's demons. So they were, oh, that's sad. So the kids were taken away from her mom. Like, that's what this says. Like, that's really sad. So, so basically, they did deem that they needed to be removed. So they were taken away. During their wardship, which means they're like, like staying with their foster family, the children were given evaluations by separate psychologists. Each evaluation report concluded that the children's behavior was reinforced by their mother or relatives. In the meantime, several exorcisms were performed by Reverend Magnot. By June, Ammons and her mother had moved back to Indianapolis. By November, the children were returned to their mother. The DCS met with the family with their assessment and found no demonic presence or spirits in the home. This article is strange to me, but it would sound like a typical county not wanting to deal with it. So basically, they're saying that the police officers witnessed this. Um, there's a doctor that witnessed it, a CPS worker, a psychologist that witnessed it. And they took the children away from their mother, but then they returned them back to their mother and ended the report with saying no demonic presences or spirits are in the home. Of course they are, because unfortunately, you know, where they have foster children, they're just like so overwhelmed. They have too many kids in the system, so they probably just deemed it was fine and then, and then it was over. I just want to look up this doctor and nurse really fast, so I'll be right back. Oi, this is the third take of this. I don't know what's going on. So the first time I filmed this was yesterday. Footage was lost on three sources. Of course I have backups for my backup. I think it's kind of ridiculous to have four backups. I don't think it would have mattered in this case. And then I filmed this earlier, which you can tell I had a different color of lipstick on, which was my Lime Crime Blue. And I'm like, I dropped the footage to check it, and it cut off at this point, which is weird. It's the point that I'm talking about the doctor, so let's back the truck up and let's try this again. So for those of you saying you have weird stuff going on in your house because of the demon house, Obviously, I'm having technical issues over and over again. Okay, we stopped at the point when I actually got up and left to go check to see if the doctor is legitimate, okay? So I did look him up. I cannot pronounce his name. It's Onyekawu. That's not right. Jeffrey O. Onyekawu. I don't know. He is an MD, family medicine, internal medicine doctor, 3814 Grant Street, Gary, Indiana, 46408. He has really good reviews actually online. <laughs> Not that that matters, but. So the doctor that has been referred to over and over in these cases is a legitimate doctor. Not only in Gary, Indiana, but he exists. I did look for the nurse, could not find anything on the nurse. The nurse's name is referenced over and over again, but I could not find that specific nurse. So I don't even know if she's still, or he, is still there in Gary, Indiana. Moving on to Captain Charles Austin from Gary, Indiana Department. Zach just mentioned that he had been shot, but I actually wanted to research it for myself. So I found this really sad article, and the title literally states, Blood Trail Leads to Suspects in Gary, Indiana Police Captain's Shooting. And this was dated March 3rd, 2017. So the actual investigation part of it um, and like the actual crime took place uh, February 21st, 2017. So about a year ago. Three men are accused of breaking into a retired police captain's home last month. The investigators say that they thought the house was abandoned, they kicked in the back door, and they were met with the sound of a gunshot. Devin Dixon and Fautre White, 1920, and Cameron Briscoe, 19, all of Gary faced charges of aggravated battery, battery by means of a deadly weapon, resulting in serious bodily injury, according to police. So these are two of the kids that broke into um, the captain's house. It says that officers used a trail of blood to track them down. One of them had been shot in the wrist during the incident. 
It's unclear through court documents which weapon discharged to make the injury on his arm. Austin, who was 65, was taken into the hospital for treatment. And as of February 23rd, he was expected to recover. So um, the police chief was expected to... So Captain Austin was expected to recover. Okay, the next one, I wanted to look up uh, Chief Brian Miller. <clears throat> He's another one that was on the documentary. He did, I did find actual paperwork on him. It says that he had retired, I believe, April of 2014. So anyways, he is legitimate because this was written March of 2014 and it said he is retiring next month. So that would have been April of 2014. I also found out that the Reverend did get approval for the exorcisms through Roman Catholic Diocese of Gary. So I mean, in order to get approval through the Archdiocese, we know it is very hard, it's difficult. So. Obviously, he had something compelling to tell the bishops or whoever approved it, and he was approved over and over again to do these exorcisms. The next person I wanted to look up, you know, once again, we noticed with, unfortunately, Nick Groff and Ghosts of Shepherdstown, a lot of the people that were involved were not real people. They were actually actors. Uh, they weren't actual, like, real witnesses. So I wanted to look all these people up to make sure that there was legitimacy behind this documentary. There was another person interviewed, Commander John Gutska. Gutska. And I found this on LakeCountySheriff.com. So this is his picture. It's literally directly printed off of the internet. It says that he spent the last three years um, at the Lake County Commander Investigations for criminal investigations. Prior to that, he spent 14 years with a special victims unit where he investigated crimes against children, crimes committed by children, domestic violence cases, and sexual assaults. He trained child forensic interview, and he's interviewed over 1,000 children who've been sexually and physically abused. So that's probably why they brought him in, if he was kind of a pro at investigating children, because, you know, the three kids that were involved in this case. So he is real. He's a real person. The next one that I'm going to bring up is um, Dr. Barry Taff. And to be honest, I'm shocked that we haven't seen more of him in our, in our field. So I printed a ton of stuff about him off of the internet, and he holds a doctorate in psychophysiology with a minor in biomedical engineering. He's a world-renowned parapsychologist. Um, he worked with the UCLA's formal formal parapsychology lab from 1969 to 17 uh, to 1978. And he's done over 4,500 cases of hauntings, ghost, poltergeist activity. He has also studied telepathy and precognition. So he's an interesting person. I do follow him on social media. Um, just Barry Taff, look him up. He has a Facebook page and a Twitter page. It doesn't look like he uses his pages very publicly. I was hoping to get some sort of an update on his health for you guys, but I could not find a thing. But his website, if you're curious, is Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, Taff, T-A-F-F dot net. And he has a lot of his case files on there from different things he's investigated and done. So if you're curious and you just feel like having an open mind and reading some of the stuff that he's done, like with a PhD, which I think is amazing, look him up. I was really impressed by... Um, his website. It's, he has a lot of really cool stuff on there. I appreciate that he has his doctorate, but that there are just unexplained things you can't explain. And he also was a part of the Entity case, so I just kind of wanted to go over that with you guys. So this was a book that turned to a movie, but I found a little short blurb about it. The Entity case was also known as the Doris Bither case. It's um, the Entity Hauntings, which is a, an alleged haunting that occurred in 1974 in Culver City, California, where a woman named Doris Bither alleged that ghosts of three Asian men were raping her. The case inspired the book, The Entity, which was also made into the film in 1982. Doris Bither was a mother of four children. She had contacted paranormal investigators Barry Taff and Carrie Gaynor, who came in to investigate on August 22nd of 1974. 
Bither alleged that she was attacked and raped by an invisible entity that she believed were spirits of three men. She claimed two of them would hold her down and a third would rape her. Taft claimed to have photographed orbs during the investigation, and Bither had a history of physical and substance abuse. So they're saying the woman had physical and substance abuse. She had been in multiple abusive relationships, and she would had a traumatic childhood. Investigators noticed that there was a poor relationship between Doris and her three sons. The home was also in poor condition. It had been condemned twice. So Taft did say that he photographed orbs, and the frequency and intensity of the of the actual attacks deceased with time. Bithard died in 1995 of pulmonary arrest. So that's sad. I have a lot of opinions on this case, but we'll save that for a rainy day. I also printed out some more information. I just wanted to talk to you guys about geomagnetometer um, actual sensors or machines. It measures anomalies of the Earth's magnetic field which enables and locates the biology significant site related factors. Its vertical intensity of the Earth's magnetic field is measured and data can be transferred via serial interface to a PC or laptop which will present a 3D graph. So it's basically like a fancy on steroids sort of EMF meter, tri-field meter, except there's a lot more sensors to it. I don't know how much these run, but I was thinking about just out of curiosity looking those up. Wow, an earth magnetom earth magnetometer, right? That's this? Yes. $780. That's crazy. It's interesting though cuz I'm at this site that basically shows Gauss meters and they go from like a tri-field meter which is like 150 all the way up to these really expensive fancy ones, $780. That is crazy. I have heard of people using ion counters uh, to possibly measure spiritual activity, like if frequency levels a what the hell? It looks smoky in here, and I don't know if it's just me, but when I just looked up, I realized it looks smoky in here. And can you come in here for one second? Did you call me? Does it look smoky in here to you at all? Or hazy? No. It doesn't? I swear, a minute ago, I just looked up and it looked like so hazy, it was blurry. Like, I couldn't see in front of this. I mean, I don't still see it. I just want to make sure, like, are my eyes going bad? Like, what the hell? You don't see anything? No. I just want to get this video over with. <laughs> I seriously do. I'm just so over it. Anyways, ion meters. Um, anyways, ion meters. Um, anyways, ion meters. Um, anyways, ion meters. Um, so they do have ion meters here. Uh, 410 all the way to 720, depending on what you want to spend on it. So... I feel like it's gonna take forever for me to get through this video. I don't know why, it's just like, ugh. And so many complications surrounding it. Surrounding it, surrounding it, surrounding it. There's one person that I could not find much on, Ed Wybe, Ed W-Y-B-E-E, -E, supposedly worked for NASA, he was in a part of the documentary with Zach, and he was, you know, showing that this wasn't, you know, moved or elevated footage through editing. If anyone can find any information on him, will you please send it to me, because I couldn't find anything on him. Now that we have finally made it to the end of this video, are you guys still experiencing weird things like I am? I'm sorry it's late, I'm sorry that we've had all of this confusion and chaos surrounding this video, but I am happy that I can finally get it up to you guys. I really encourage you guys to join Twitch because it's turned into something that's more than about me. It's also about this paranormal family that we're trying to you know, create and build and I think it's important because when you're in paranormal sometimes it can feel lonely and dark 
because not everyone in your personal life understands how interested you are in the other side. So I really feel like building this community has been important to me and knowing how close everyone's gotten on Twitch is even more important to me. So please try to come on Twitch and interact, not with me, but with everyone else. I really think that you'll enjoy it. Make sure you guys give my video a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys follow me on social media and I will catch you guys next time.